Let's bring up Teresa. I hope I rolled my R right. Um, woo! Moses. Also known as Terry. All right. Hi, y'all. How y'all doing? Y'all doing all right? I, I almost want to make y'all stand back up because y'all not about to fall asleep. Okay, I know we had lunch. Y'all better wake up. Like, come on, come on. All right, so I don't want to get into my time. I really do want to um, talk about some stuff today. So I'm going to be talking about blackness, blackness, all of it today, um, and socially conscious design. So if you're like me, you like agendas, you like to know when is this thing about to be over. So here are the three things, the three sections to look out for, okay? So I'm going to talk about who I am, the work that I do, and the future, right? Isn't that a cute picture of that little black baby right there? Right? Okay. So, who I am. Um, this is actually a photo of me speaking at the Women's March talking about white supremacy. That really like sums up who I am. Uh, <laughs> so, um, let's see. First, ooh, I'm hella black. I'm queer AF. Okay. And I'm a badass woman. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Okay, so these are some of the identities that I hold, okay? Um, what you don't see, right, is that I'm also a survivor of domestic and sexual violence. Mm -hmm. I'm an advocate, like a very strong advocate for marginalized communities, making sure that we have a voice, that we're represented. Um, and I'm also a social justice warrior. I know some of y'all have heard that before, but I'm really into like doing these self-assessments now. And uh, this, this assessment, I don't know if y'all have heard of this, uh, Charles Young's Four Archetypes, right? Um, and so I'm definitely a, definitely a warrior. You know, we get, I do a lot of stuff in the community, so folks like will call us if somebody's been like battered by police and they, like, they expect myself and my partner to do something about it. And uh, you know, so my reaction is always like, who we need to beat up? You know, who we need to go and protest? Like, we need to go on City Hall, we need So that's my reaction, my, my gut reaction, right? Um, and is anyone else like that? Okay, we got a few people, that's all right. Yeah, you kind of, yeah. And I think you can hold more than one of these identities for sure, but I know that's where I show up, you know? And then so my partner, he's a strategist. So he's like, I'm not about to be at the protest, but I'll help y'all plan how to take down the system. Like, so that's, that's him, you know? He's like, calm down, we're gonna figure this out, you know? And then you also need the nurturer though, right? Because you need the person to say, okay, are they okay? Like, do we need to give them a gift pack, like a, a package, a care package, we need to give them something? So we need the nurturer, that's just not my role. Like, I just wanna beat somebody up at that point. Like, I'm just angry. Um, and then you had the visionary, the person who's motivating. So I'm pretty sure I fall kind of in the warrior visionary thing, because I'm like, I can see a better future. You know, I think at the last Design Plus Diversity Conference, uh, uh, someone came up here and was talking about how they're looking for pissed off optimists. Y'all remember that? Yeah, and that, that is totally me. Like, that's, you know, my, my vision, you know, I have so much hope, and I'm so excited about what the future can bring, but right now I'm pissed off. I'm real pissed. So, that shows up in my work, okay? And I've been kind of dealing with, uh, is it, uh, maybe some of y'all are dealing with this, but like, as a designer, I'm like, am I also an artist? Like, I don't really know if that's really my thing. And like, hell yeah, I'm an artist. <laughs> <laughs> so I do a lot of illustration and my identities, my experience, it shows up in my work to be able to tell a message. I'm really about that whole idea, Rich was talking about propaganda. That's really what my stuff is about. It's about to move you, change you, make you feel something, help you understand what it's like to be me or be a black woman. Um, and so these three pieces, um, this series, I do stuff in series too, I'm kind of obsessive that way. Three things of each. Um, and so uh, I have uh, my experience is what the series is called. The first one's called Heartstrings. Um, is any people any, any black people, had anybody tried to touch your hair before? Or touch your, yeah. So you know what I'm talking about. It really pulls at my heartstrings that you think, and you have so much privilege to come over and just start to touch my hair. Um, and so, you know, on the hands, you can't really see there, but it says like racism and privilege and, you know, all those things. The second one is talking about like the, you know, elimination of, you know, our history as black people. Like people try and call it indentured servitude. And it's like, nah, we were slaves. Like, uh, and so the, and then the third one is called counterfeit. Um, and that one talks about how, you know, people want little elements of blackness, but they don't want all of it. Right? right? Y'all know what I'm talking about. Um, and so that's what that is. They want, you know, I want the big lips, you know, I want the big butt. Uh, I says my ass right there. Is that okay to say ass? Um, <laughs> they want hair, you know, they want darker skin, but they just want those little elements, right? This uh, second series here, remember y'all saw that photo of me talking at the Women's March. So this is, I was inspired by my, by my own self. <laughs> Can I, can I be inspired by my 
so, so at the Women's March, you know, at the end, you know, I had this, I was just like, it was, it was lit, y'all, I was like going off. And uh, so here's some of the things that I said. I said, um, excuse me if I side eye your white feminism, or if I roll my eyes at your ability to say thank you without investing in what I do, uh, or if I backhand your white privilege to touch my hair. I was going off, y'all. So this is, a, this is a series that I did based off of, based off that speech. So this is, this is, y'all had, this is, y'all the first people to actually see this. I'm working on this still. I have a solo show coming up in November. And uh, I'm talking about the, the intersectionality, right? Real intersectionality, you know, what Kimberly Crenshaw was talking about. Not like, oh, I'm also like white and also blah, blah. No, intersectionality. Talking about being black, being a woman, all the margins of the margins, right? And so I'm talking here about, and I was talking to Diane about this. Um, I have these six themes that I'm gonna be talking about. And I'm really specifically talking about, uh, let's see, we have gays, right? Um, you know, the, the white gays on black women. Um, we have here uh, danger or ang ang anger um, in the red. So I'm talking about like, the mortality rates of black women. You know, we're more likely to die um, having chi uh, children. Uh, and this other one I'm talking about um, burden. So we have this woman holding up like this vase, and I don't know if you can kind of see it, but it kind of looks like the, like the world. You see Africa there, like kind of cracked up. So you have a cracked up vase, um, and then we're also, so we have the burden of holding up the oppressed system, but also the burden of creating the new one, right? Because people don't want to take on our issues because they're a black issue. Y'all have to solve that when really we didn't even create it in the first place. I was stolen, you know, from Africa. So y'all need to help us out, right? Um, the second one, or the blue one down there is talking about control. So I'm talking about a specifically religious system, um, controlling black women, especially the black church. And then um, I'm talking about uh, liberation in the, in the purple. So I just have like this big naked black woman just looking, you know, okay. Um, and then I have another theme that I don't have done up here yet, but it's called savior. And I have one of the illustrations is like a black woman uh, becoming a life vest. And it's like this white man sitting here and she's like this life vest because like we're always trying to save people uh, or expected to save people, right? So that's how my identity show up in my work, uh, my personal work, okay? So the other work that I do, all right, uh, I'll be talking about my design work, my design research work, and then what I do as an educator, okay? So those of y'all need the agenda, that's where we at, second point, all right? Okay, so uh, Blackbird Revolt, okay? Yeah, I got a woo, okay, all right. Y'all go on Instagram, follow us, yes. Um, so, Blackbird Revolt, um, myself and my partner, what we do is um, promote social change through conscious creativity. Um, that is literally our mission. We want to keep it short and sweet. And we wanted to make sure that um, we weren't put into a hole of just being like a design agency or, you know, those expectations, what people think about that. Because we do a lot of organizing in our community. Um, Rich, I was really like inspired. Where are you at? Okay, Rich, when you were saying like, you know, you can't just be like the design people, you have to be like building those relationships. That's what we do, that's really what we do. Um, and so we do that by hosting workshops. We do a lot of stuff with kids in our community. Um, so yeah, so that's some of the stuff that we do. Um, here, remember I was talking about me being a survivor of uh, sexual violence. And uh, we work with this group, this nonprofit. We do a lot of nonprofit work with Menace Peacemakers. Um, they're like an anti-violence against women organization. They do a lot of programming within schools to teach um, like young boys about toxic masculinity, all of those things, about racism, homophobia, transphobia, all of those good things. Um, so we were able, we work with them almost every year to create their fundraising, uh, you know, their fundraising branding for their, uh, to get money, right? Uh, secondly, um, we're still around that same topic. We worked with the College of St. Scholastica, their Violence Intervention and Prevention Office, um, to create some materials that college students will engage, engage with and actually like take and like use a sticker, use a button, things like that so they can actually begin to educate in an engaging way around these topics so that we can kind of break those stereotypes and really talk about gender equity and things like that. So that's another project that we were able to work on. Uh, anybody, everybody know about the NAACP, right? Yeah, yeah, okay, so I got some snaps over here. Um, so, NAACP, um, I, we work with them every single year. Well, okay, let me stop. I work with them all the time because I sit on the board <laughs> as the second vice president um, and I also chair the Young Adult Committee because you, know, you go to NAACP meeting, it's like over 50 plus, right? AARP, where you at, you know? So it's like, <laughs> 
So there's no young folks, and we're the ones really lighting the fire and, and being the pro, you know, tearing down the statues. And so it's, you know, it's really important that we're able to engage and have the you know, young adult committee. Um, and so what I do also work with them is uh, MLK is like a really huge time for us. Um, and so what we are able to do the last three years is work with them to brand the events. Um, and so that's what you're seeing up here. I also advise the chapter up at UMD. Um, and so that's, those are all of the people on the board for the UMD chapter. Um, and so we, we also have a march and all that, so you see the map there. So, um, man, white folks were so mad when they saw this <laughs> because they were like, are you saying white people are pulling down black people? And I was like, oh, that hand is blue. What are you talking about? You know, uh, so <laughs> what are you saying? It sounds like some personal stuff you gotta work through. Um, so. The theme was called The Current Crisis and Race Relations. Um, what we do every year is we read, um, we go through Testament of Hope, which is all MLK speeches, um, and we look to see what theme. So when we're talking about like, oh, uh, NAACP does just give us something and we create something to spit it out. No, we're like, here are the themes, here are the summaries of what his sermons were about, um, and so let's talk about this together. And so, you know, I'm so heavily involved, you know, there's no way to really kind of separate community and, and the work that we do. So this is um, an example of that. Um, also, when you're working with nonprofits, they ain't got no money, okay? And you're trying to do the right thing, but it's like, I also have to eat, okay? And so it's really important for you as designers to make sure to think creatively about what does that mean for you and how can you get that money. So not only are we, a, we are, um, you know, my partner really into uh, uh, grant writing, so that's one thing that we do when we work with nonprofits is we'll help them find grants. You know, but also, um, this was a really fun way of raising money, is, is a poster series. We got someone in the community who screen prints, and so we had these limited edition posters, and everybody was like, oh my gosh, I want one, so we would raise some money that way. So we'd have them available at our events, we had them available online, people could purchase them, you know, we signed them, it was all kind of official. So, um, so this was just a creative way to be able to do that. Um, and if, if I didn't explain it, I don't think I explained it already, but the orange is really talking about the system. It's kind of dragging everybody down, right? Um, and then as we kind of come together and then we start to fight together, um, the orange kind of starts to dissipate. So that's what that's about. Oh, okay, so not only do I sit on the board of the NAACP, but I sit on the executive uh, board of Clayton Jackson McGee. And Clayton Jackson McGee um, is the first memorial to lynching victims in the, na in the nation. Um, and so our, the lynching that happened in Duluth, Minnesota, where I'm at, um, is uh, what happened in 1920. And three men were, um, were lynched for um, this white woman accused them of you know, sexual assault. And it uh, turns out, of course, that that wasn't the case. And so, um, so they, were, they were lynched, and so we have a memorial there, and I'm gonna show you a quick video um, just kind of spanning it. So we actually worked with this organization to rebrand them because if you don't know anything about uh, about the system, this nonprofit system, is that uh, you have to look good to be able to get that get money as well. And so we worked with them to rebrand them. I also sit on that board, um, but uh, the that video was shot by um, one of the. Uh, it was a student at UMD, she just now graduated, and so she was a student of color. So whenever we do any work, you know, that isn't our specialty, like videography or whatever, which we're kind of dabbling in right now, but we try to work with um, people of color. So that's just something I'm gonna throw out there for folks to know. Um, so uh, Clayton Jackson McGee, they were uh, three men, uh, circus workers, so they were not from Duluth. Even the statues that they have there that they created were actually from three men in our community. They're not, because we don't know the likeness, you know, what they look like. Um, and so what we're doing right now for their 100, uh, 100 year commemoration is, you know, we branded that event. We, um, all, all of our events that we're having from now until June 15th of 2020, um, we're giving out these buttons that just says, I'll be there, 61520, uh, um, to make sure that folks are out in the streets. There were 10,000 people that they got just on that one day. They rounded up 10,000 people in Duluth. And Duluth, well, it was a lot bigger then, but 
Duluth right now is 86,000 people. Um, and so they rounded up 10,000 people and just within a matter of hours to get them to drag these three men out of jail and go lynch them on, uh, uh, what is this, uh, light pole. And so what we want is 10,001 people out on the street to hear one, what we have to say, to hear from our keynote speaker, Brian Stevenson. If you don't know about his work, look him up. He's amazing, doing a lot of stuff on criminal justice. Um, and so that's, that's kind of what we're working on right now. Also with Clayton Jackson McGee, um, we worked um, your, uh, uh, with uh, elders in the community to oral histories. Um, if you all don't know, a lot of people of color are not gonna write down stuff. And so oral histories is really a way of capturing um, what happened in the past. And so um, they did it in an amazing way because they had the young folks, like they had like, teen, like youth, um, interview the elders. And so we got those transcripts and we, you know, uh, not we, my partner read through all that stuff. That was four hours worth of transcripts per elder, because you know, they be talking. And so, <laughs> so we made these individual panels, right, um, of all of their story, like, you know, summed up, you know. And so we summed up their story, and then we also had these really large panels. You see there, the fight. We had the work, the life, the fight. And so we talked about through time, um, not only on just a local scale, but then we had the larger pictures, which was what was happening nationally at that time to allow those things to happen. So those are, that's just an example of uh, some the exhibition that we put on called the uh, Black Duluth in History. We also sell stuff, yeah. So Black Bird Revolt, like really, we love working with, with people, but it's like sometimes you just gotta like put your own message out there, you know? And so that we do sell stuff, we're able, we have the privilege to do that, have t-shirts, we work um, with folks in our community, we really try to stay local as possible. Um, so we do posters, t-shirts, stickers, buttons, all of those good things. Um, and then we work with artists. Um, uh, I know folks who are really just, just artists, and oftentimes they're like, website? Mm, I ain't doing that. And so we're like, okay, how can we help promote the work that you're doing? So here on the side, we, we um, just did some, a promotion or a blog post for a, um, an indigenous artist. Her name is Mary Villiard. Um, also up there on the top, there's another uh, indigenous beadworking artist. And, um, she, you know, she, she, uh, they came to us and we were like, oh, well, um, we can, you know, take your work and put it online and, you know, we can sell it. And then when we met with them, they had all of these designs, which are our designs, but in beadwork. So it's really amazing, really intricate and really beautiful. Um, and we also worked with a feminist artist from uh, Minneapolis uh, that gave us a feminist series of posters. So that's the kind of work that we do. So if you're interested in working with us, you have like some, uh, some design that you want to put there, email us, you know, whatever percentage you want, whatever, you know, we're really trying to be equitable in our uh, design practices and our business practices. So if you want to work with us, shoot us the email. All right, I'm good on time. Um, Project Natural, so we're talking about design research now. Project Natural um, is my baby. Um, this was something that I started when I was in graduate school, um, really thinking about natural hair and how it affects my self-identity. So um, while this isn't like the best picture, this is just an ecology of all the things that were happening in my hair choices. So um, I started to, you know, it took me a very long time to go natural. Um, I don't want to be like totally over people's head. So let me explain real quick. Uh, when I was eight years old, that was my first time getting a chemical relaxer, which changes the chemical makeup of your hair. So it's no longer, it doesn't look like this, right? Um, it's straight. And so um, I had a chemical relaxer for almost, almost 20 years. So I never even knew what my natural hair texture looked like. Um, and chemical relaxers are really, really harmful for black women. And because of all the health disparities, there's actually not a lot of research on it. So it affects us a lot. Um, and the chemicals are very dangerous. Like it burns your, I mean, I got burned probably every time I had a relaxer. Y'all know what I'm talking about? Um, so <laughs> I got burned probably every time. I remember the first time I learned that you cannot scratch your scalp before you get a chemical relaxer. Like, I mean, it was, it's really bad. Um, and so um, what I decided to do was look at that issue a little bit more. Um, and so what I'm looking at here is like what all the things that were affecting my hair choices. I had my interpersonal relationships there on the second level. So when my sister got her jerry curl and then she got a relaxer and I was like, man, why is my hair so nappy? Like I just, I want it to be straight like yours, you know? So I had all of these things happening that were influencing my decision when I was make, uh, trying to get straight hair. I have mass media up there telling me what I should be looking like, right? What's professional, um, what looks nice, you know, what's good hair, all of those things that were influencing me. And then what was happening uh, culturally. You know, so I talk a lot about you know, what's happening in the nation and whatnot. So not only did I do like autobiography, but then I had to go back historically, right? So I looked at nations from like West Africa um, and their hair practices. And I found out that um, they could be in the salon chair, I call it salon chair, but they could be in the chair 
for like two or three days because the braiding, braiding styles are that intricate. And so you can imagine the relationship building between the person that's in the chair and the person that's like doing the hair. You can imagine what that does to a community. And when you, we were stolen from Africa and we were brought here, and we were working six or seven, you know, seven days a week, there was no time to do hair. So oftentimes when you see pictures of slaves and things like that, like even this photo here of like uh, America, you know, and emancipation, the black woman still has a scarf on her head because we didn't have time to do hair. And then by that time, by emancipation, all of those traditions, all of those things were forgotten. They were lost, right? We didn't have the same products. All of those things were gone. Um, and then you start to see as we move forward, folks are trying to assimilate. We have Madam C.J. Walker with the hot comb and we got the horrible relaxers and lye and all that to help straighten our hair so we can assimilate to society. And then we have the 60s come about, 70s come about with black power movement. So our hair really became a political statement. So I looked at all of those things, those historical you know, movements. And then looking at today and like why women decide to go natural. So I interviewed and surveyed probably over 200 women. I can't remember the exact number. Um, but I try to figure out like, I know this can't just be my experience, right? And every time I start to talk to a black woman about hair, we, we can talk for like an hour or two hours at least just about our hair because it's that much attached to our self-identity. I mean, think about every time we had church and we was going to Easter, it had to be done. Somebody had to be laid. We had to go over here and stand. I mean, it's a big deal, okay? And so what I decided to, oh, continue with research. I did some observations at a natural hair salon. Um, I did some graffiti walls, so people got to write their opinions of when I asked certain questions on the wall. It's just a research method. Um, and so then I had, uh, I did some concept mapping around that after I got all of that qualitative data. And then I had this long ass thesis statement uh, question, <laughs> which was basically asking, how can I educate and connect and empower black women and help them make empowered decisions around their hair? That's really what this is. So what I found, uh, my hard deliverable, what I ended up doing in the end, was creating, um, using design to create uh, these illustrations that one, showed the versatility of natural hair, because that was a big thing with women um, who went natural. They were like, I didn't realize I could do so many things with it, right? I can still wear it straight if I want to, but you just don't have to use a chemical relaxer. So I tried to show that in these illustrations. I started off with 12. Um, I have the hairstyle up at the top there. And then I have a quote from one of the women that I interviewed. So you can't really see the quote, but this first one is my favorite quote. And it says, uh, there's a fine line between looking homeless and looking fashionable with natural hair. And I, when I heard that, I was like, yes, you better say that. Because sometimes I wake up and I'm like, oh, scarf. <laughs> You know, and then like, you know, you, then you go out and people are like, I love that scarf. I'm like, oh, thank you, girl, you know? So, uh, so yeah, so I had these quotes from women. I started off with 12. Um, if, uh, there are 188 different hair textures in the black community, so I wanted to make sure that folks knew you could wear this hairstyle whatever texture of hair you have. And so I just used natural objects. The first 12, I used feathers. And so this was what it looked like in the space. Um, this is just a corner there, but it was a really large space and I had video and photos and all that. That was the first year, which was 2016. The second year, um, I added 12 more and I used leaves as the texture. Um, and, some, and you'll see here with cornrows, um, not only sometimes I use, most of the time I use quotes, but um, sometimes I'll use uh, articles, like clippings from articles, and I talk about appropriation. So you all know about um, Kim K trying to say, you know, where the, where the braids come from. But we know where they come from. Okay, and we never get, you know, we never get credit. Again, we just want elements of blackness and not the full package. Um, with this, when I displayed this one, um, we decided to do a symposium, a one day symposium. So we had guest speakers come in, panelists come in, we did some product tutorials. I mean, it was just like all encompassing thing. And I was like, oh, this is amazing. How could it get even better? Um, and so um, I got a grant to host workshops the next year. And so I had workshops um, that went through, if you see like the ecology there that y'all saw on the screen, they make their own ecology. And so I had an eight, I mean I had like six year olds all the way up to 65 in the class. And so they had, it was a cohort and they had six different workshops over three months. And so we did like product making, we taught folks how to corn row, we taught um, uh, so many hairstyles, we talked about the natural hair textures, we talked about the history of natural hair, um, and all of those things. We gave out like all kinds of, of empowering stuff, like Solange's CD, and you know. <laughs> we, get, we tried to really make sure that folks left there empowered and connected with that community. Um, oh, so this is another picture. Yeah, so we have like, um, you know, mannequins. And that's another disparity in itself. Do you know how hard it was to find an Afro 
mannequin to like, oh my goodness. Like, and there was, it was like just so expensive, but you know, the grant paid for that, so. <laughs> all right, and I was inspired by all these youth. And so then I was like, oh my, the ones that I add next, I added, I did six more and I have 30 in total now. I think I'm gonna stop. Uh, <laughs> but I was like, let me add some youth. So they see themselves in these hairstyles. And I did flower petals um, as the texture of hair for these ones. Ooh, I have, uh, and here's it in the space. And again, we had a huge symposium, so again, we brought the mannequin heads back out and all that. So I have a, a video, so y'all get to see a little bit of what it was. We did a hair show, so you'll kind of see that in the video. Like it's so much better. Like these kids were like walking down, just like you know, just strutting it. It was just so cute. But what I, my vision for the hair show was to have uh, natural hair art, and then the art of doing natural hair, which is what you saw um, there. So it was really, really cool to put that together. Um, all right, I'm also an educator. Okay, I know with all that you're like what. So I'm an assistant professor of graphic design at the University of Minnesota in Duluth. And um, while these projects are really awesome, I just want you to know the struggle of my audience. So Duluth is 92% white. And so um, I have had two black students total, and they, I've only had them for one semester because they transfer out um, the semester after, all, you know, both of them. Um, so most of my students are, are white. So because of that, in graphic design one, um, which is after they had their foundational, they know how to use, well, they know how to open up Illustrator. Uh, <laughs> they have graphic design one, which is the class that is like, here's how to become a graphic designer. And so the first project is about black people, you know? And so it's funny on the reviews, they, they, you know, they like to say, oh, you're too political. Bump y'all. <laughs> You know, like we learned about whiteness for 12 years. Y'all about to study black people for six weeks. Like, I don't know what to tell you, sorry. So, period, thank you. So, um, I, what I do is I assign them a, um, it's either a black activist um, the first year, a black song was the second year, and this past year was a black experience, like Montgomery bus boycott, you know. Um, and so I assign that to them, and I also design, assign them a black designer. Right? So that opens up their eyes. So they're like, oh, there's black designers? Why, yes, there is. <laughs> so I assign, <laughs> I assign them both you know, that black experience and then also the black designer. And then they create a poster, and then they also create a notebook, a pamphlet. Um, and I say pamphlet, it's eight pages. And I ask them specific questions so they can't just copy and paste from Wikipedia. Like, y'all have to really think about this. So they write, you know, they write out, um, they design the booklet and stuff. And then what they do is they sell it. So what I'm teaching them is that not only can you do awesome and amazing work, um, but you can get paid for that, right? Um, and so 50% of those profits goes toward the NAACP. So I connect it, right? I connect it. We're talking about blackness. We're talking about anti-racism. I connect it then in the community. And so when, you know, they don't even really see the impact until the exhibition when people are coming up to them with tears in their eyes saying, oh my gosh, you really like, you know, showed this experience in a great way. Like I remember when this song came out or I remember looking up to this activist. So they don't even see it until like other people are like telling them how great it is. And I'm like, I've been told y'all, but whatever. <laughs> so, so this is just a, a, a we were in like a whole, um, they did a whole news article, which is why I have this amazing picture here. Um, but then those are the, those are the two exhibitions that, um, that we did. 
Another project, I mean, all my projects are about social consciousness. I just don't understand how you can make a project that's not about that. Like, can we stop assigning, like, just these random ass businesses as projects? Like, can we stop saying, we're gonna make an ice cream shop? Like, stop. Like, that doesn't matter. <laughs> and you know, too, just while I'm on my rant, I am so sick of, like, all of these white faculty members telling me that they can't just do this because they're not black. So all the responsibility falls on me as the black professor? Bump y'all. Yeah. <laughs> all right, so another project that I do is um, I have them work with an after school program. And um, these kids have amazing stories, right? So I'll give them prompts and stuff. And they're talking about really deep stuff, but I give them uh, prompts. Um, the, the, the facilitators there at that after school program work with them to write out their story. And then my students illustrate the story for them. So they come back, you know, and they start to see stories of people that look like them, you know, and, and so it, it's really funny because I couldn't even have prepped it um, well enough. Like the facilitators of that after school program, they come in there and they say, you know, these people are not like you all, you know, they talk about how they're students of color, they talk about how they have marginalized ident identities. And so it really like opens up their eyes to say like, how can I make sure that I'm using, you know, that I'm illustrating something that's like them. And so they get to create these stories. We already know the, the disparity between like storybooks, right? Not having a lot of people of color. So how can I, you know, then create something for this kid that they'll resonate with? And it's really amazing. Like, let me tell you, when they come back with these stories, like these, you know, all these kids are like, how did you do that? So then we are exposing these kids to something that they probably didn't even know was a choice for them. You can be designers. Right? So there's just so many creative ways. We're all creative thinkers. Like, can we stop just doing like the BS projects? Like, I'm so sick of it. All right, I got my Bachelor of Fine Arts in Fashion Design. So I like to spend like three or four weeks on doing some type of, you know, apparel design project. Um, but we're not just gonna just design something that you think is cool, right? We're gonna do something socially conscious. So prompt is design something that's gonna make you know, the community better. Fix the issue, you know, find an issue that you're excited about helping and you're gonna use that in using fashion design as your solution. Right? And so we look at like folks um, are designing for adaptive, adaptive clothing. Or we have a person here who designs some accessories um, in case they're being like followed because you know, they have a personal experience with like assault and whatnot. And then we have another person talking about um, depression and anxiety. So we have this like kind of doodle jacket. Do y'all have a doodle bear when y'all were younger? I did. It was pink. Um, and you could put it in the washer and you just draw it and stuff. And so they use that whole concept in their work with the doodle jacket down there at the bottom. And the last project, if y'all came to the workshop um, yesterday, Racism Untaught, you will already know about this, but if you, know, you want more details, you can go to racismuntaught.com, um, and they work through a system where I, I assign for them something that, uh, that is racialized, and then they create an anti-racist solution. Um, and so in this case, what I, um, this class, when I got it assigned to me, um, they were like, yeah, usually you know, they're taught packaging in this class. And I'm like, okay putting on you know, my cap. I'm like, how can I make this something that'll be relevant? So I'm gonna assign you some racist packaging and you're gonna redesign it. You know? So it's so simple to make your, our projects you know, socially conscious. So I assign them Aunt Jemima and Uncle Ben's. Um, if y'all know that's racist, it's racist. Um, <laughs> and so what they ended up coming with, up with in this whole process is at the end they created a transition packaging that apologized because they realized um, corporations don't apologize for the things they do. They say, we're sorry if you felt hurt you know, they say like those really things, you're like, what, you don't even know. So um, I signed them, um, the, they did the uh, transition packaging, you know, it says vintage racism is still racism. And so they're talking about that in the, in the uh, transition packaging and then the last, uh, the final package is yours truly because it's not black women in the kitchen cooking for you, it's you. So <laughs> it's called yours truly. Um, and I told them to send it, you know, I told them, I said, send it over to them, you know, I don't know if they did. But yeah, but my, you know, the students, they're just like, you know, they're, they're, their eyes are wide open. They're like, oh my gosh, I didn't, you know, I didn't even realize, blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, oh, so now you know. So now they're seeing all kinds of racist stuff. Like someone said, uh, someone came to our, our school and was talking about design and they, I think they said Eskimo. And, and one of my students was like, did you hear that? They said Eskimo. And I'm like, I'm so glad that y'all are learning. You know, I'm, I am making an impact even though they're mad about it, but you know. <laughs> all right. The third section, y'all keep it track, it's almost done. I, I promise, I'm, I'm almost done. So I just wanna leave y'all with some stuff, uh, what I hope for the future, okay? And um, what, just some tips, like with the fight. Um, and I bet you if I did this presentation again, like next year or something, that my tips would be, would be completely different because I'll just be continuing to learn. So my hopes <clears throat> is that blackness, um, the full spectrum of blackness can be integrated into design, okay? Not just the little pieces that we want, right? All of it. Thank <laughs> you.
okay? So that's one of my, one of my hopes and my dreams, which is what I try to do with my work. Um, secondly, I want representation, but um, I was just telling this <laughs> to Diane yesterday, like, I want, fo I want representation by folks who want to represent, okay? I don't want folks who are just like, oh, I want to be another CEO of Starbucks. And I'm just like, what does that do for the community? Like, it does nothing. Like, just because, you know, you have that identity, you're still perpetuating the same system, right, that's alienating people and discriminating against people. So I want representation by folks who are going to use their experience and actually start to change stuff, okay? Oh, by folks. I'm like, you want to take a picture? <laughs> okay. Um, and then my third thing. If anyone else is working on this, y'all, I put this up here so you can contact me. So right now in my community, I'm working on the abolition of police. Yeah, yeah. Um, and so I know for some folks, you know, they're like, oh, you know, abolition, like how is that gonna work? Like what are you gonna replace it with, blah, blah. We figure it out, right? It starts with defunding, you know, the police. I'm all about it. So we can have a whole separate conversation. I don't wanna go off on a tangent, but that is one of my hopes is that we can use design to really tackle this issue and really look at preventative measures. Like, think about, like, this is the question I'll pose to you if you have a question about why I'm fighting for this, is why um, do police exist in the first place, right? Crime. So why does crime exist? Poverty, mental health issues, um, substance use issues, right? And so don't we have preventative things for that? Are they getting funding, though? So um, there's a lot of things that we can use design for to help solve with this issue. So those are my three hopes, okay? Okay, I just want to leave you out with some tips. Oh, I'm doing so good on time, look at that. All right, get woke. I know y'all heard this, right? <laughs> I know y'all have heard this before, um, but I'm really not even talking about like, you know, oh, get woke to the issue. Like, I feel like folks are sleeping on themselves. So wake the hell up. Okay, and stop sleeping on yourself. Find out who you are. Like I said, I'm super obsessed with like these self-assessments because I want to know what I bring to the community and what people I need to be working with. Right? So get what? Flex on them. Can y'all do this for me? Flex, flex. Yes, flex on them. That's actually not what I mean, though. Um, <laughs> What I'm talking about here is be flexible and know that after you do get woke and find out, oh, I actually am a warrior or I actually am a strategist, um, know that that can change, okay? Just like gender is fluid and sexuality may be fluid, you know, all of those things. Um, we want to make sure that we understand that, like, just because I have this box right now, next year I'm, I might not be there, you know? I might not want to show up in that way, right? So know that that's gonna be, you need to be flexible. All right, who, like, I like this photo too because it looks like that face that, when somebody says something to you, you know, and you're like, what? Who are, you who are you talking to? I remember hearing that from my mom all the time, right? When you say something, you're like, I don't want to do that. And she's like, who are you talking to? I ain't one of your little friends, right? <laughs> but this, what I, what I mean with this is just to make sure that when you bring your ideas to the table, that that's the table you need to be bringing the idea to. And that's the approach that you need to be taking to deliver that idea. Sometimes you need to keep that here and work with a whole separate group. Like I work with the NACP on some things, but like the abolition of police, they're too legalistic for me to work with them. So I have a side group. So I know who I need to bring my ideas to, right? So who are you talking to? All right, what's canceled? Um, we, in, my, in my group of friends, we say that's canceled, right? R. Kelly, canceled, right? Totally. Um, so know what's canceled. This is what I mean by being up to date on like the news. I remember like my early 20s, and it's because when I was growing up, I, I really didn't like to watch the news. I thought it was boring, and then I always heard like, oh, it's so depressing. Like I just don't watch it. Um, watch the freaking news, y'all. Know what's happening um, in our communities. Like, you know, star on Facebook, star your local newspaper so that it pops up into your feed first so you know what's happening. Because um, you can't affect change if you don't even know what's going on. Um, so that's one thing, like figure out what's canceled. Also, under this category would be language. Know what's canceled in language, right? It, it, it really took me a long time to get out of the um, saying guys, right, guys, guys, because there are so many people who are not guys, so I try not to say that. Or things like um, crazy. Figure out what you're saying, what you mean to say when you say crazy. Um, for me, I say, uh, what do I say, wild now. That's a good word to say, right? Oh, that's wild, that's wild. That's what I mean, it's like, you know, I never could have thought about that, it's wild. Um, so things like that, so just know, you know, like saying lame, we don't say that, right? That's ableist, right? Yeah, so say that's whack, you know, or whatever. So figure out other words to say, because if we can't change our language, how are we gonna change policy, right? We can't. 
So figure it out. All of the low hanging fruit, like all the stuff that we can do right now with even the words that you say, figure it out and figure out what's canceled. Stop playing. Stop playing around, y'all. We need to seriously get, get serious. Seriously get serious. Okay, about the work that we're doing, all right? That means taking some really, that means making difficult decisions, um, but we need to seriously get serious and stop playing around on these issues, really integrate it into everything that we do. Isn't this cute, that little girl? <laughs> Build your squad, and what I mean by that is, again, if you know how you show up in the community, and you know the talents that you bring, kind of like what Rich was talking about, then you'll know who needs to be on your squad. I don't need a whole bunch of warriors, because we all just gonna be like, yeah, we're gonna fight, we're gonna, I don't, I don't need that. <laughs> Sometimes that's, that's good though. You know, when I come here, I feel like hyped up, you know. But like, you know, I can't, I can't, that's not who we need to all work. We don't all don't need to be warriors. I need strategists, you know, I need nurturers, you know, we need to make sure we self care. Please don't ask me a question about self care too. I'm still figuring that out. Uh, but build up your squad, all right? Know where, how you show up and who you need on your team. And then look at this, look at this face. Don't just look like disgusted. Like. Step your game up. Step your game up. Um, I feel like um, our society and our culture just uh, uh, allows us to sit there and continue watching Netflix and expecting other people to get shit done. And you have to step up and get shit done. So step your game up, okay? Um, I think that's it. Yeah. Yeah, y'all. Yeah.